be live streaming tonight, or are we just videotaping? No? Okay, we're videotaping. So for our later watchers, hello, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Ben Travers, I'm on the Ward 5 NPA Steering Committee. Um, and I think we have a small enough group here this evening that it makes sense for us to just go around and for everyone to introduce themselves, perhaps let us know uh, where you live in town. Uh, so uh, I'm Ben, I live uh, here in Ward 5, right on Home Avenue. Folks standing there, you want to <laughs> uh, my name is Jen Olson. I'm the policy and programs manager for the city of Burlington. Um, and we do not partake in child labor, this just happens. <laughs> <laughs> they're really small ones to fit in the pipes very She's not on the payroll with this fire. Let me know, I have called holding her. If she wants to do anything, oh. stand up. Oh. And I make a lawyer and the division head for water resources. So I'm in charge of water, wastewater, and stormwater tonight. Oh, I'm Smith. I live across the street. I'm talking tonight about electric uh, trans public transit. Uh, city officials, city departments, and so on, I come out and speak. But I really appreciate your, your coming forward as, as a resident with a really innovative proposal and using this as a forum to uh, to discuss that. So hopefully, it can perhaps be a beginning of something new. If neighbors have something that they want to talk about in this forum, that's that's great. Yeah. yeah. So thanks. Looking forward. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lucia Capriello. Um, I'm a steering committee member here, and I live over on Heinrich. Uh, Chip Mason. I live on Scarf Avenue. I'm sorry if I saw um, Near Ben, uh, and I am the Ward 5 City Council. Hi, everyone. I'm Mom. Oh, sorry. What are we going on the back here? Um, I'm just a second. I'm Hamdi. I live on Pine Street and I'm a student at Champlain College. Hi, I'm Pitt Jamani Vaughn with CETO. Oh, um, I'm Savan Suna. I'm Pitt's daughter. Um, I, uh, I live in Boston. I'm just visiting for vacation. Awesome. Thanks to your family for always giving up your mom. Yeah. So, thanks to Pitt. Alright, I'm Mohammed Jafar, I'm right on Pine Street, and I am also one of the city committee members. I'm Laura Mistretta, uh, I live in Ward 3, and I just came here to talk about some stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, hi, my name's Betsy, I also live in Ward 3, and I came before I talk about, talk about some stuff. I'm on project for work on I'm also from Ward 3, so we're. Oh, nice! Hey. 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 Oh, hi, we can be outvoted. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Carolyn Bates. I live at 20 Caroline Street. I've been there since, uh, been here since 73, and I'm always interested as an employment uh, director at one point, too. I'm Ruby Perry. I live over on Locust Street. I'm Sheer Stenbaum, and I live on Dunder Road. Andy Simon. I live on Locust Street as well, and I'm on West Street. Thank you. So, thanks everyone for being here tonight. Um, just a logistical announcement, our, our meeting's been sort of bouncing around to a couple different locations. Uh, next month, it, we have decided next month, right? Yeah, okay, so uh, next month we're going to be trying out the space that's right next to Pizza 44 in Queen City Brewery, and we're going to try to introduce some uh, pizza and uh, drink to the meeting beforehand. Um, so, pizza on us, uh, drink on you. Uh, so, um, but, uh, but we're going to try that for a couple months, that space right there at Pizza 44 at Quincy Brewery. So, uh, we'll post it on the agenda, but just we're excited to uh, check out some different spaces here in Ward 5. Um, okay, so with that, uh, we have an open forum period now, so we'll open the floor to anyone that wants to say something for open forum. Mark, do you want to come up here? Sure, okay, yeah. Great. Yeah, join me. Um, Alright, so yeah, like I said, my name is Laura Mistretta. And Betsy. And um, to give a longer introduction to why we're here, um, we are volunteering and, and work with a group called Community Voices for Immigrant Rights. And this is a grassroots group that formed over the summer in reaction to the Trump administration's ramping up of inhumane border immigration policies. Um, now this group 
We don't believe that the immigration crisis began with Trump, and we don't believe it's going to end with Trump. Um, so we're really about advocating for you know, humane border policies that we haven't seen yet in this country. Um, and we have spent time organizing protests and rallies on the national issues that are really hard to make an impact from here in Vermont. But now we're transitioning into actually working on a local campaign right here in Burlington to um, improve you know, our city uh, for immigrants and new Americans. Um, the name of that campaign is No Mas Poli Negra, which is Spanish. Um, it, it roughly translates into No More Immigration Police. Um, and so it's really about um, making sure that our local police department is not, you know, spending its time and resources on targeting immigrants and separating families right here in our city. And um, yeah, I talk a little bit more yeah. about what that means and what that looks like. So, um, the state of Vermont, we have a fair and impartial policing policy. Uh, but Migrant Justice, the group that kind of came up with the language that we're working with and the policy that we're pushing. Uh, has learned through its like constituency, migrant farm workers, that there are four really big holes and loopholes within our fair and impartial policing policy that's statewide, um, and it basically results in that like local police departments can and do often share information with ICE and Border Patrol, and so most recently, like at the end of November, there was a farm worker. Um, Shiri, whose name is Louis Ulloa, Ulloa, Ulloa yeah. um, who was pulled over, or he was in the backseat of a car. Uh, the driver was pulled over for speeding. Uh, the county sheriff asked for his documentation, basically. Um, he had a Mexican passport. The sheriff detained him on the side of the road for two hours, called, I think, Border Patrol, yeah. um, who took him to a detention center in New Hampshire where he's now waiting deportation for being in the backseat of a car that was speeding. Um, so this is a kind of example like, of, of what can happen with these loopholes. And so what we're working on is, is language that was adopted in Winooski last year. Uh, they like, have not had any issues with it. They adopted their um, updated fair and impartial policing policy language unanimously within their city council. And so we're asking ours to do the same. Um, and it's basically <coughs> close the four loopholes, which I can't remember off the top of my head, but I can read them to you. Um, so the current loopholes are it, that it allows for the reporting of immigration status of victims and witnesses of crimes to deportation agents. It evades prohibitions on asking about immigration status by allowing officers to rely on the pretext that the person is suspected of having recently crossed the border. It allows the sharing of confidential information with immigration agents so long as it's justified on grounds of public safety or law enforcement needs. And it grants deportation agents access to individuals in police custody effectively turning local police stations into temporary holding cells for ICE and border control. Yeah, so we've been working you know, to educate ourselves on this issue and uh, we're starting to, starting to talk to various city councilors. I think we've reached out to you, Chip, at some point on this. I'm just um, trying to figure out who's someone from my Gina? Yeah. Gina, yeah, Gina, so she's part of Community Wizard. Right. Yeah. 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 She's like with you us. You just read what she had said. So yes. Yep, yeah. We're working together. We are an organized <laughs> group of people. Um, I'm like, you should meet Gina. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you know, we're, we're doing our outreach. We've done our kind of behind the scenes outreach, but now is really the time to bring more people into it. We want to be educating folks here in Burlington about it. We want to welcome you to join us um, in, in helping us get the word out about this campaign and policy. Um, you know, the Community Voice for Immigrant Rights is a larger group. We meet every other Monday at the Rights of Democracy office. Our next meeting is January 6th at 5.30 p.m. with dinner from the People's Kitchen. Um, and then our group, No Mas Poli Migra, meets every Thursday. Um, though next week, I don't know what will happen, but we, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> maybe not next week um, with the holidays, but every Thursday at the Rights of Democracy office at 6 p.m. So we would love to have you there. We'd love to, you know, take questions if there's time now or hopefully get on the agenda at another point yeah. and answer lots of questions or come to you know email us whatever um we've got an email address on these flyers that you can communicate with us through so and a sign up sheet if you want to just like know you already are down and want to be added to our list um or just know about events that we may put on so yeah thank you so much here's the right to yeah, so it's on North Winooski Avenue, 241 North Winooski, so right across from like Bush and Bay. Yeah. Right across from what? 
Butch and Dave's, it's a restaurant in yeah. Gilmore. Yeah. Yeah. It's the McClure building. Yeah. There's a children's center. Yeah. 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 Sure. Especially some of the people up on the 
Union Street. I mean, I think they have triple locks up there yeah. to be able to earn some money and put an accessory dwelling in it on. But we don't want developers to use it, so that we just have a bunch of rentals. Yeah. But it is um, <coughs> rental homeowners. Uh -huh. I was just very excited, and oh, you should tell your city council one. Wonder Woman's right here. I want to be sure that you really push this and go for it. And I think it's a great, a great thing. Uh, we had a uh, we had a meeting at Champlain Elementary a couple meetings ago, and the mayor came in to talk about various housing initiatives. I know Chip and the Oregon's committee has been really dedicated to that. Do you just want to say briefly? Because just, just from a process, more than it's all from a process perspective, the, the way it went around is the first read is being referred. So there will be a work session held before the city council where this will be discussed at length. Um, then there will be another opportunity and another public hearing for the public to weigh in. Um, so if anyone has, I'd be happy to, I spent a lot of time with ADUs, I'm happy to answer questions after the meeting or otherwise, but um, we're at the beginning of at least two more steps of the public process where input will be solicited. Great. Okay. Anyone else for open forum? Okay. Uh, so, Megan, turn it over to you. Um, as far as advancing, yeah, you can use this now. Okay. And then if you need to go back, you have to like right click. Okay. Okay. You just let me know. I'll go back. And time check wise, do I still have 30 minutes or? Yes, we had we had like a 10 minute break in this building, so we can always. Okay, no, I just want to check it, and I want to make sure that I leave enough time for questions and I don't go too fast. Yep. So thank you very much for joining me here tonight. Um, we did get to mostly the MPAs in November, which is why it says November, but just to say the best for last. Uh, and are hoping of coming to talk to you um, today about our rates and affordability project. So tonight I just want to make sure everybody knows, you know, where the money that you pay on your water, sewer, stormwater bill goes, what is it that we do with it, and the capital investments that we've been um, pursuing. Talk about why it is we're doing a rate study and why we're concerned about affordability and trying to tackle that right now. Uh, look at a summary of the catalog of options. So we're still in the like, let's look at everything in the kitchen sink and then decide what maybe makes sense for Burlington for repairs here. And then want to make sure that you are aware of the project schedule. It's a very fast project schedule because we're trying to get things um, voted on by the council before the next fiscal year. Uh, and so I uh, just wanted to make sure everybody knows sort of the next times where we're going to be coming back and talking to you more about the specifics. So this is really just sort of an overview, making sure you understand why, why it is we're doing this. And what it really comes down to is we do believe in the city of Burlington and hope others believe that everybody deserves access to clean water. Um, and that's made up of two things. Uh, first of all, you need to make sure that you can provide the clean water. You need to make sure that your treatment plants are working and you need to make sure that you have infrastructure, the pipes, and the collection system to carry the water in various places. The challenge is, is in, in order to really do the clean water piece and to take care of your plants and invest in very, very old infrastructure, you often need, and we have seen rate increases, we need more money in order to take care of the system. In a lot of ways, Burlington um, is kind of making up in the 1990s, there was 10 years without a rate increase. And I just, I, I look back and if we had just had little tiny ones, Back then, I think we would have been in a much different place. We would have been able to start on some of these really important projects, which I know are messing with your lives during the summer, but they are really important. Um, one of the analogies that I give, because I think we're going into another season of construction, is you know when you redo your house, uh, it is very terrible when you are having to live without a kitchen and you're doing your dishes in the bathtub. And inevitably, when you're doing one project, you, you know, you're trying to redo your kitchen and you find five other things you have to fix at the same time. That's usually kind of what happens and kind of some of the reason why things sometimes take longer in the city is things don't always go according to plan. Um, and it is really challenging. I live in the city and uh, trying to get around in the summer is, is very hard. But afterwards, right, when you have a street that has been paved and you know that the water line was fixed beforehand so it's not going to blow up, the next season, you know, that is a good thing. It's like that really nice kitchen. Um, so in any case, as we start getting into needing more money, we are worried that that's going to butt up against the affordability, right? We don't have a terrible affordability problem here in the city. There's not a huge amount of delinquent payments, but we know if we look out as to um, how we may need rate increases in the future, we could be finding ourselves where people are having to make a decision between 
buying food or healthy food or buying medicine and paying their water bill. We don't, we don't want to live in a world like that. So taking a step back, one thing that's important to know is the, the, the money that goes to support water, wastewater, storm water is entirely separate from the taxpayer base. So it's not funded at all by taxes. That is an entirely separate pot of money. It is entirely from the, water, the, the fees that you pay on that water, sewer, storm water bill. Um, in total, it's about uh, $17.5, $18 million that we collect. Um, we serve uh, a, approximately 10,000 connections, so all of the residents of Burlington, and we do sell a small amount of water to Colchester. And currently, we have 43 full-time staff. On the water side, the main functions of the Water Enterprise Fund are to provide clean drinking water. We, Even though there's a, a drinking water plant, Champlain, Champlain Water District, at the end of Pine Street, Burlington gets its water from its own drinking water treatment plant, which is in the on the waterfront in between the Coast Guard and the Moran plant. Um, and the water system or the waterfront has been uh, is the oldest of the three waters uh, since 1867. Uh, Burlington bought the I think Burlington Aqueduct Company, and from there, uh, you know, took things over. The other piece that the water um, fund or the water system does that people don't think about is the fire protection. So all of the hydrants, we have to have enough pumping capacity that if a large fire broke out in the city, and we actually have to prove this when they go to do the insurance readings for the city, that we're able to you know, provide the fire department with sufficient fire flow that they would actually be able to put that fire out. So that's sort of a, a side benefit. Nobody's technically paying for that. Um, uh, all the ratepayers are paying for it, but it's the, it, one of the things we're looking at is how we may be able to charge for that in a slightly different way. On the wastewater side, um, it's one of my favorite parts of the wastewater system, the aeration system. This is where all the bacteria live. They are the big workhorses of the wastewater system. They do all of the munching and processing of the bacteria. And we call it wastewater, but more and more we do try to think about it as water recovery. You're basically using clean, potable water, right, in your toilet. It's drinking water in your toilet. You put dirty things into it. It comes to the wastewater plant, and our team works to strip all the muck and the dirty stuff so that it can return clean of water as possible to the lake. Um, uh, things, you know, haven't always gone well. 2018 was not a great year. Thanks to the support of the voters, we are well on our way to making some improvements to correct some of the issues that happened that year. Um, but, you know, the plant generally, day in, day out, does an amazing job and, um, you know, removes 95% of the phosphorus. If we didn't have these wastewater treatment plants, the situation with the lake would be much, much more terrible. Uh, and we treat an insane amount of, of water. The Halloween storm went off without a hitch. The plant behaved perfectly. Um, but we processed almost as much water in that Halloween storm as we did in Hurricane Irene. Um, the amount of water that fell was so substantial. And again, moving on to storm water. Storm water is the, the baby of the waters, right? So in the 1990s, people started realizing that storm water wasn't really as clean as they thought it was. It looks cleaner, it's not as dirty as wastewater, but it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see after a storm event all of the muck that collects on the roadways and does get into drains. There are parts of our system that are on the combined sewer system, so that storm water is going to a pipe and is getting to the wastewater plant, it's actually getting to <coughs> But the large majority of the system, because we separated to get away from combined sewer events, um, has no treatment whatsoever. So that dirty water goes into a storm drain and goes right out to the lake, right out to Inglesby. And so uh, that's something that we're looking at. We're actually trying to now retrofit and figure out how to reduce that pollution, because it is a large volume of pollution when you look at it year after year. And then the other piece that the stormwater program does is work really hard to continue to take water off of the combined sewer system. Not through separation, because now we know there's problems with separation, but through controlling it at the source and when and where we can, letting it soak back into the ground, because um, that's really where stormwater wants to be. Um, you know, I mentioned that the work that we've been doing with the support of the council and the voters, you can see for a long time we really just weren't reinvesting in our system. It wasn't until FY17, FY18, and certainly FY20, this, these additional bars represent the money that we will be spending as part of the Clean Water Resiliency Plan. Like We're doing a much, much better job, and thank you for continuing to realize that we do have to invest in these systems. Um, these costs you know, create debt service. They create line items where we have to then pay for many, many years. And, and then every year, operation and maintenance costs also go up, just like your gas bills and your, um, if you have employees, 
those, those bills go up. So we're constantly fighting the battle of, of, of increasing costs. Um, as a result, as I said, we have had over the past uh, five to seven years, you know, fairly modest rate increases. I think for some, they, they look very big. When we compare them to the national scale, they, we are with, well within the average. And when we talk with our financial consultants about how we're doing, they actually think we're doing pretty well even to keep things in the 4 to 5% range. That being said, if you continue on that trajectory, even though the rates are quite, you know, somewhat affordable right now, you pay about $50. So the average uh, single family home who uses 400 cubic feet a month, um, which is about 3,000 gallons, uh, pays just under $50, $50. Right now, the rate, rates are such that everybody pays the same. There's no distinction between a residential user and a commercial user, and that's something that we're looking at because when you talk about essential access to water, a resident needs water in a different way than a commercial entity does. And so that gets us to our rate study. Um, and the last time we sort of started to come up and talk about um, rate increases, particularly as, as part of the staffing increases that I need or our team needs in order to really provide you this clean service, you know, the council kind of, well, met us where we were already kind of going, but made sure that we were going to get there by requiring that we pursue this rate study, that we look at a number of things, including a, uh, a tiered progressive rate structure that would, that would protect that essential access to clean water. Um, and then we also wanted to look at affordability programs. So in total, the, the effort that we're undertaking this fiscal year is to really look at our financial planning, make sure we're collecting enough money, that we're not uh, short, being sort of short-sighted, that we're developing appropriate policies for reserve, um, that we are taking care of our capital needs and our repair and maintenance needs. We then want to make sure that we're equitably recovering those costs. Should different customer classes be charged the same, or maybe they should be charged differently? And then even once we tinker with the rate and we have that progressive tier, we need to recognize as we have rate increases, there could still be low income uh, or income burden customers that are paying a significant portion of their annual income just to get this essential access to clean water. And so we want to look at the possibility of developing sort of wraparound programs that provide them additional discounts if they are in that income burden <coughs> situation. So some of the things that we are looking at, um, one thing that we don't have right now, but a lot of entities do, including Burlington uh, Electric as well as Vermont Gas, is a, a fixed charge by meter size. So um, right now, the way we charge you is entirely based on how much you use. A lot of other utilities have realized that whether you use water or you don't use water, I still have to make sure the water's available. I still have to have a meter there. I have to have all my infrastructure. And so in part to stabilize rates or stabilize the fluctuations in rates that may occur due to people using a lot or not using a lot, um, that's one of the things that we're looking at. Now that's going to be a change and there's going to be, uh, for some people, it's going to mean that they're paying more, uh, more sort of as a portion of their, their bill. Um, but that's some of the conversation that when we come back in February and March, we really want to bring you those examples so you understand that. Um, we're also looking at a, a number of different uh, fees and charges. Primarily that would, or entirely that would affect either new developments or commercial entities. Uh, these, these four here would not affect um, residential users. And then that piece that I was talking about, that lifeline biometric rate, so if we consider at this point that um, the average single family residential home uses that 400 cubic feet a month, perhaps that first block of water, not unlike electrical rates, um, is a little cheaper, right? And then if you are somebody who loves to take long showers and you have those means, then go for it and we may end up charging you a little bit more for that. Uh, and then that last piece as I men mentioned was the low, the low income customer assistance programs. Now we don't want to get into verifying people's income, we don't have staff for that, so we're hoping to leverage other federal programs. So if somebody is on SNAP or um, somebody is on the, the Lifeline um, benefit that allows access or gives you a discount to internet um, and phone lines, right? You show us proof of that and then we provide you some sort of discount. Right now it's kind of looking, just to give you a preview, it's kind of looking that the discount would uh, sort of tackle that, that fixed charge. So for some customers that might go away and those customers really would only pay based on how much they're using. 
That being said, the world of affordability programs, it's, it's huge out there. There's tons of things that we can do and want to do. Um, so we are, we're kind of trying to sort things into a phase one, phase two bucket at this point. I think there's other programs that we're really interested in, like um, increasing some water efficiency options, figuring out how we could provide low flow toilets, low flow fixtures to folks to really help them tackle the affordability piece that way. Um, and one of our biggest questions and struggles, and this has been a struggle across the nation when people are trying to implement affordability programs, is how to help renters. Because renters, uh, most renters in Burlington pay their water sewer as part of their rent. And so there isn't a way to specifically help them. Because you can imagine, I could try to help them, or I could help the landlord, but then I can't prove that the landlord is passing on the benefit to the um, to the renter, um, and so I think New York's the only place that's done it, and they've only done it through rent control, like that's been the only way to unlock that, that animal. Um, that being said, we're, we know that there's so many renters in Burlington that we have to address this, and so we're, we're not stopping. I just want to make sure that folks don't get blinded by that gap when we try to pass at least a good program um, when we get through, uh, get through our study. Um, and then lastly, so we're here, um, we're now in December, we're crunching numbers, we're, you know, spreadsheets, models, tweaking this, tweaking that, looking, looking specifically at how different tweaks to the rate will affect different classes of customers, and so that we can hopefully have those conversations uh, with those various people. In February, we hope to be having a, a work session with the counselors, um, and ideally with the public as well to kind of present the options that we've landed on, what our recommendations are, get that feedback, so that we can go back to the drawing board, um, actually, so that we can take that feedback, also come back to you guys in March, make sure you're on board, you don't have, you know, you guys probably have ideas about how you might want to see things tweaked, and then we're going back to the Board of Finance and City Council in April to hopefully have them bless some portion of what we're presenting so that we can then use that for our FY21 budget. Um, there's more information on that website. I, I actually meant to bring copies of this presentation, but I don't have it, but I can, you guys have a copy, so if anybody yeah, is interested. <laughs> yep. Um, my colleague Jenna is outside, so if there are any other breaks, if you have any other burning, dying questions about water, your water meter, or anything, um, that's what she's there for. Uh, there's lots of great materials out there, and I will definitely be happy to take some questions on anything, not just rates. Carol? Um, two things. I know that um, a while ago, I was a few years ago, you came by my um, house and it said that if I dish my yard between the uh, sidewalk and the street, that way the water would run off the sidewalk and into the ditch and into the garden and did not have grass. Or I didn't, I don't know if I had grass then. And so it would be real helpful, I think, if, if there were some things like that or to make less less lawn and more garden. Mm -hmm. Little things that people can actually easily do without, I mean, it's maybe muscle power, but it's probably not additional expenses that we can do to keep, maintain the stormwater, at least for normal storms, on our own property. Mm -hmm. And I know that uh, several of us, I know I've done that, where all my gutters run down. Actually, what I've done is I've put a pipe Three feet underground, so that the water all back drains the down there. Yep. But under that big storm that we had, here comes my. That because of behind my house are all the gardens for all the people all the way up to Sheldon Road. Mm -hmm. The water ran for four days through yes. my property. Yep. Um, and maybe there's some way we can get the gardens to trench all the way down that hill to, to uh, slow up that water and keep it on their property. So that would be real helpful to get individual easy things that we can all do. And then the second thing is, is that it was interesting. I think everyone ought to have a fee for however many meters they have. So if they have 10 meters, it's maybe $40. And if we have one meter, like I do, it's $10 or something. And that then after that, based on perhaps the square foot of the building or the use of the building, um, I don't think I should be paying the same as the commercial building is down yep. downtown. I think that's your immediate source of revenue and it may really help um, trying to do more affordability 
I, I don't really I don't really feel good to know that I'm paying the same as a downtown big building. And, and, and I have 1,200 square feet on a lot that's too small to build on. Yep. Um, the, the rate structure that we are looking at now, uh, that cer right certainly, yeah, no, the, the commercial folks would be paying a different rate. We're not, at this point, planning on charging the same residential as commercial. Now, how different the commercial rate is from the tier two, but certainly the commercial rate is going to be higher than that initial lifeline water that people are having access to. And I just want to give a shout out to Caroline, uh, the the whole keeping water on your own property. I know people think it doesn't make maybe make much of a difference, but if everybody kept a little more water on their property, that means less water in the roads, less water in the pipes, less water that hits the plant all at the same time. So it really it really does make a difference. It's a little bit harder in the in Ward Five. I'll be honest, your soils are not as happy. I live in Ward Three, which has like 65 feet of sand and I can, get all, I can get rid of all of my water, but even during that Halloween storm, I have to tell you, I was in my basement and like I was shoving socks and all sorts of things in my stone foundation because the water was pouring in so much. It was, it was terrible, but I think it is more of what we're going to see uh, with extreme storm events. Something to have our eyes on. So thank you. Well, you have to know that Andy and Ruby have done a remarkable job with their property in yeah. Bolden Back Storm Water. Um, did you do uh, the Bluey TV program? Yeah. What did we do? What? I said you have done a remarkable job around your house. Oh, just in terms of maintaining uh, stormwater, uh, keeping it there, and the gardens, awesome. and and catching the water. But I guess my question uh, for you, Megan, is um, so if um, people were allowed to have composting toilets. Um, if, if that actually caught on and people wanted to do that as, for one reason or another, um, wouldn't that um, reduce the water load, uh, both the water load and the um, clean processing load quite a bit? And what, what are the obstacles? The obstacles, it's weird because somebody actually emailed me about this today. And it's come up in the past, and I know that it was a lot harder than any of us wanted it to be, and I can't remember exactly why. I think it has to deal with the state and or potentially like building permits, plumbing code. Um, yes, I mean, it would help. It's not, again, it's not something that we, from a policy perspective, are going to try to implement, but from a environmental perspective, anytime somebody uses less water, um, that means less flows at the plant, which can sort of like regain some of the capacity. So if people are wasting water, it all goes to the plant and that can eat up the available capacity that we have. But then yes, if you were managing your waste in a different way, uh, that can certainly that can certainly help. Yeah. So it's hey, you know, maybe for your ADUs you can. Well, that's how it came up. Somebody contacted us about a tiny house and could they have a composting toilet and a gray water system? So not so any of the like sink water or shower water would go out into the yard. And it, it's fuzzy in my head because I think it was like eight years ago. But I there was somebody at the old North End that was trying to do that, and I I just know that it was a lot harder than it, it should be, and it the regs probably haven't caught up with where people are at. And then making sure if you do have a composting toilet that it, you know, it's, you have to treat it appropriately and it can go south and then you end up not having a toilet facility which becomes a sanitary issue. I think that's some of where the state gets stuck. Um, one of the places I would also like to see things become easier is stormwater reuse. So if you could collect the stormwater, particularly for commercial buildings, and use that to flush toilets, because it's dumb, my opinion, <laughs> to flush toilets with drinking water when you could harness the storm water, keep it from getting into the combined sewer system, and then use it as your as your flushing system. So and it's sort of on my long list of like other icing policy stuff. We have so much heavy policy stuff that we're trying to get through um, now, um, and also development of programs. So you know, doing things on your own property. We did have a program, a pilot program last year at Bluey TV where people, somebody would come and assess your home and recommend a few things that you could do to improve water quality on your property. And then we had grant money available so that if the person said, hey, you're a great candidate for turning your, you know, adding down spouts, capturing the water that currently falls onto your driveway and getting it over to your yard, and we paid for that. Because if we can prove that it's cheaper, um, or at least no more expensive to spend that money on your property, 
versus trying to dig up a roadway and put in a bump out or a tank or something, then it makes good cost effective sense. So that's a program that I would like us to see, you know, solidify and codify. Same thing, one of the um, affordability enhancements on the stormwater side, we currently offer stormwater credits for commercial properties. So if a commercial property has demonstrated, like um, here at City Market, they haven't actually filed a credit application, but they would be eligible. That bioretention, the island that's in the middle of the parking lot, that captures stormwater. It makes me so happy every time I come here. Also not dying when I'm trying to park. Um, but uh, so they would be eligible for they would be eligible for a stormwater credit, but currently um, residential folks are not. I'd like to see if somebody's done something substantial on their property, you know, give them a fifty percent discount on their stormwater fee. It's not gonna like it might pay for a nice meal over the course of the year, um, but just in recognition that like somebody's made the investment and is maintaining a system that helps all of us and helps keep our lake clean. No, you guys have no grass. I have no grass. There's some That's great. people like that. What happens in a in a big um, in a in the large developments that are happening in Burlington in terms of um, wastewater and stormwater management? Well, I only heard you talk about really residential and uh, individual things. For example, that at Burlington College, that giant. Mm -hmm. um, development that's going in, are they required to do certain things that actually contribute to the overall um, improvement of the system, of the of the infrastructure? Financially or just in general? Just, just Let me start. So yes, one of the things that we have to look at that is leveraging all of the new development and the redevelopment um, through our Chapter 26 ordinance. To, uh, so if somebody built something new, they have to manage their impervious surface, whether they need a state permit or not, 100%. They need to demonstrate to us that it's not going to have an impact. Um, in the case of uh, Cambrian Rise, that, that's the project, they additionally, because they were going to be increasing the wastewater flow in the combined sewer system, we additionally made them do even more with stormwater, and they're actually building or cost sharing with us a project that will be taking off stormwater uh, from North Ave. So we're taking storm drains on North Ave and infiltrating that water to offset the fact that they are going to be taking up more space um, in the pipe. So any pr uh, that project, uh, at least the former approvals for the, the mall, uh, that was fully disconnecting all of the roof water that currently went to the combined sewer system and tank, tank uh, detaining it and treating it and then sending it to the separate. So pretty much any substantial commercial projects that you see, like my team is scrutinizing that and making sure that they are doing as much as they can to make things better. Even redevelopment, you could have a parking lot there and one could say, if I have a parking lot and I build a, a building, I'm not making it any worse. Well, that's not good enough for us. We need to make it better. So we actually require them to manage at least 50% um, so they go through a modeling effort to show what they would need to do to make that site look like half of the site. Um, and usually we like to see people do infiltration, getting the water into the ground where that's not possible, and sometimes they do tanks or rain gardens that filter and slow things down. We always try to use green stormwater infrastructure where possible, like the, the, bump out of the, um, the median, because we feel like it provides other community benefits. A tank will function, it provides stormwater function, but it only provide stormwater function. Whereas something like that, you know, provides habitat for birds and bees, it's a lot nicer, it creates more cooling, so we really try to push those types of projects when and where we can. Does that answer answer your question? Yeah, I've been at Canby and Rice, they've done what seems to be. So, um, so at Cambrian and Rice specifically, they have infiltration systems, so all of their stormwater uh, the new roadways have store have uh, bioretention bump outs, so they'll have things kind of similar to um, similar to what's in the middle here in the parking lot. And then any excess water that the gardens can't handle will actually go to a larger subsurface infiltration system and leverage the sand that is on that site. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. One more question. Did you have a question, Spencer? Or? Yeah, I live across the street, the Flint Avenue Concord home, mm -hmm. 24 units, and we have a large parking lot, but it just flows into the ground. Right, and yeah. yeah. Yeah, So, uh, is there a chance that somebody could come and look at it and give us some ideas of 
reasonably costly. Yeah, uh, I think one of the challenges you have when you have the outfall, the outfall pipe for the whole area goes through your yeah, parking lot. So yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, as far as available space, it's hard because you are right up on the brook. But um, mm -hmm. I believe I'm trying to think if that property was actually assessed as part of the flow restoration plan for Inglesby. I can ask Jenna um, oh. or, and or I'll ask her, but we can connect yeah. the two of you out there right. and we can look it up. So I think there may be a rain garden, a large fire retention area in between uh, this, the 180 Flynn and you guys that was supposed to collect the, the water. There is kind of a marsh with some trees between us and... Uh, right, I think that was going to maybe yeah. be formalized. Yeah. Uh, at least I'm remembering yeah. it in my, my mind's eye. Yeah. Okay. But retrofitting, I think you're talking about it's really hard, but that's what we're charged to do, mm -hmm. is these existing properties that have been there and they, they were there when there was no stormwater regulation, and now we're trying to figure out how to cram stormwater treatment back into our streets, back into some of these properties. Uh, there's a new regulation from the state. Really large properties, three acre, uh, that have three acres or more of impervious are actually gonna be forced mm -hmm. to retrofit, um, which is a good thing, yeah. sort of cost effectiveness going after these larger, these larger properties, but it's gonna be really hard. Um, you know, people are used to having giant parking lots and to, have the government come after the fact and say, guess what, you have to put in stormwater treatment even if you are a, a lake lover, it's yeah. gonna be it's gonna be some headbutting, but we're, we're trying to figure out how to uh, facilitate that process. All right, great. Yeah. Well, it seems like it's been a really big lift, so I commend you and, uh, and thanks for remembering the NPA. <laughs> I appreciate your coming nice. in and, uh, yeah. and we look forward to having you back. Uh, in March as you go through the process. Yeah, so we'll hopefully really have specific examples of what we're planning on presenting or pl pl planning on advancing and, and hopefully hopefully you guys will like some of it or most of it. Um, you know, no plan is ever perfect, but... Awesome. Yeah. People want to, I think you had your website out there, but people otherwise want to get in touch with you if they have any thoughts or comments on uh, it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I got it in the minutes. Okay, there okay. we go. Great. Perfect. <laughs> cool. To the presentation. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sounds good. Thanks, Megan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Uh, we had a break built in, but in the interest of staying on track here, I think we could probably just go to the next uh, part of the agenda. If we can find some time for a break later on, we'll take it then. But uh, uh, even so, you can yes, get up at any time. And yeah, we got some snacks and cookies. Christmas cookies. Is that nice? yeah. So next thing in here we have BED with Burlington Energy right. Future. We have Karen Springer and uh, Jen Green. Welcome back. Thanks, thanks, Ben. Are we um, got a laptop here, but it looks like maybe you're so organized that yeah, that's yeah. fantastic. That great. Great. Oh, great. Better yet. So you just use the oh, no. perfect. The, Hi everybody, I'm Darren Springer, General Manager with Burlington Electric Department, joined by Jen Green, who is our Director of Sustainability and Workforce Vitality, and we're excited to be here to talk about Net Zero Energy, um, talk about the vision uh, for the future uh, for the city of Burlington. All right. Great. So, I'll oh, go ahead. Oh yeah, do you want to keep, do you want me to go ahead, Darren? I can, well, I can, Please. yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll start off. Um, we're going to kick it back and forth a little bit. Um, so this is just a brief agenda. Uh, I'm going to just give a little background on Burlington Electric, uh, some of the things we've been working on. Jen is going to walk you through our net zero energy roadmap, some of the key findings of what we've looked at uh, as the city moves towards uh, becoming essentially 100% renewable, not just for electricity, but also in thermal and ground transportation as well. And then uh, we're going to talk a little about some of the programs and incentives that we're offering to help uh, residents and businesses move in that direction. So. For folks who may not be 100% familiar with all of this, just some information on Burlington Electric. Uh, we have around 118 employees between our Pine Street office and the McNeil uh, plant in the Intervale, as well as the Winooski One Hydro plant, which is right on the river in Winooski. Uh, we operate the Winooski One Hydro and the McNeil plant. Uh, McNeil is now the largest energy producing plant in the state of Vermont uh, since Vermont Yankee closed back in 2013. Uh, so it's an important plant for us and for the state. Uh, we're 100% renewable. As of 2014, we were the first city in the nation to be recognized as sourcing 100% of our power from renewable generation. We continue to do that uh, year after year. 
And uh, you can see here our, our customer breakdown is, is just about three quarters residential and one quarter commercial. Um, about 60% of our customers on the residential side are renters. And in terms of the energy use, it's actually flipped. It's about 75% commercial energy use and about 25% residential energy use. And we are the third, third largest utility in the state uh, of Vermont and the largest uh, municipal utility in the state of Vermont. Um, so when we, we talk about the net zero goal, there are really two kind of pillars for us in terms of the work that we've done to date with the utility. The first is our work on energy efficiency. Um, so what Efficiency Vermont does for the rest of the state, we do for Burlington. We're the only utility that still runs its own energy efficiency program. Um, we've invested with our customers roughly $70 million, uh, dating back to the 1990s uh, in energy efficiency. And we're saving about $12 million uh, for our customers every single year on energy efficiency in avoided costs on our electric bills. So we have a good payback on that investment. Um, this has always been impressive to me looking back to 1989. Burlington is using roughly 6% less electricity today than we were in 1989, even as we've grown in population and square footage. Uh, if the rest of the country had done that, you could shut down more than 200 coal plants uh, equivalent energy use. So a uh, very significant accomplishment in Burlington in terms of efficiency. And this is our photo of our calendar contest with all the fourth graders in Burlington Public Schools. Uh, it was our energy efficiency calendar contest this year for the first time. It was the net zero contest. But uh, fourth graders who uh, do artwork on energy and can submit it and can win and come and enjoy a nice night of pizza with uh, me and, and Champ and the mayor and others here at Burlington Electric uh, in the picture. Um, so we're happy to provide calendars if anybody needs one. Just stop by 585 Pine Street. Um, this is just a, a reference to our renewable energy uh, supply in 2018. So on the on the left over here is, is looking at renewable energy credits. We're 100% renewable even after we both buy and sell renewable energy credits. This is our portfolio of supply on the right. Uh, you can see it's a little more than a third is coming from biomass from the McNeil plant. About a third coming from hydropower, both large and small, both in Vermont and some from New York, some from Canada. And then a little less than a third coming from three different wind projects, uh, two in Vermont, one in Maine. And a growing slice of our energy is coming from solar. That's the orange uh, slice there. 1.4% in 2018, it was only 0.3% in 2017. So it's, it's growing fairly rapidly. And we were recognized by Environment America as the number one community per capita for solar in the Northeast uh, just recently, and number four in the country. So I'm going to hand it over to Jen to talk about net zero energy. Yeah, so as you mentioned, we were the first, uh, thanks, by the way, it's really great to be here. I always like something to work five. I think uh, the thing about the city market space makes it especially welcome. But, um, so as Darren mentioned, um, we source 100% of our electricity from renewables. We made this uh, transition in 2014, and through building on that success, we are now launching into this new world, this, this roadmap, which essentially means that we're looking at a transition away from fossil fuels, um, in thermal, i.e. heating, for the case of Vermont, and ground transportation. So um, we knew we couldn't do it alone. So essentially, we put out an RFP, a request for proposal. We got some very competitive um, proposals back, and we selected a company out of Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, Synapse Energy Economics. So they did their analysis, the analysis for us, and they helped us chart our course forward. Um, their subcontractor was a local group, a uh, resource systems group, um, who was responsible for looking at the transportation uh, portion of our analysis. Um, so here we are, the roadmap is done, and we're here to sort of tell you about it and hopefully get you excited about jo joining us in this um, transition away from fossil fuels. So I want to tell you a little bit, sort of very high level, what the roadmap unveiled or did for us. Um, as you can see, this is, uh, is our um, current uh, portfolio of uh, energy use in the city. Um, we've got transportation, this is the, the um, line section here, which is in and out of the city. So essentially not BED customers for um, yeah, people that live in, in, in Burlington per se, not BED residential customers. Um, we've got uh, the building sector here, and we've got um, uh, so the darker piece is transportation in the city by um, BED customers. If we um, eliminate this, 
because in essence we can't control a whole lot of this. You can see the biggest portion of our um, energy use in the city is, is the building sector. The combination of commercial and residential buildings followed by this darker pot, which are um, Burlington vehicles. So here we are. This is where we want to, where we are and where we want to be. If we follow our business as usual, so how we're using or transitioning away from fossil fuels now, you can see the trajectory is not particularly dynamic. It's not going to get us where we need to go. The roadmap shows us that there's a pretty precipitous decline if we're going to make it to net zero, i.e. be off of fossil fuels by 2030. Um, just for sort of kicks, we decided to see what it would look like um, if we moved out that roadmap to 2040. So you can see this less precipitous decline here, um, just as a comparison. But in essence, this is, this is the pathway we want to follow. It's, it's quite dramatic. It's going to take um, work on all of our behalfs. So here is um, the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Now, essentially, this is not a climate action plan, but it, there will be very significant greenhouse gas emissions um, reduced, a reduction, if we indeed follow along the roadmap. Here we have our, the natural gas that we're going to have to phase off, phase away from, as well as um, the petroleum. I will say, again, um, if we do um, succeed by 2030, we will have decreased our greenhouse gas emissions by 69%. If we, if we do it in 2040, there's a 50% decrease. So significant on both counts, but again, we're really aiming for that 2030 goal. So um, I think this is probably the most telling or interesting um, takeaway from the roadmap. This is essentially what we need to do to get that sort of green trajectory down to, to uh, 2030. If you think about all these four pieces as sort of a pie of what we're going to have to tackle, 60% of that work is going to have to happen in buildings. Essentially, we're going to need to transition our heating and cooling systems to um, heat pumps, a variety of different heat pump sources. We're going to need to strategically electrify. 20% of our effort is going to entail um, moving away from what we refer to as ICE vehicles or internal combustion engine vehicles to electric. 3%, uh, excuse me, 15% or the third piece of the pie is uh, the district heating and I know over many years you've heard about um, the potential of tapping what we refer to as the waste heat from McNeil um, and utilizing that as a, as a heating source. So that's sort of the third biggest chunk of the pie followed, um, last but not least, of course, by alternative transportation. So that's sort of 5% of our effort. And although um, it may seem small, I think it's, it's significant and it's something that we can all start working on right away, essentially. So there you have it, what we need to do and where we need to go. So this is exciting, I think, for a couple things, for a couple reasons. One, it's, it's probably the most ambitious local government climate change uh, initiative in the country that I'm aware of. There's not any community that I'm aware of that's trying to tackle uh, fossil fuel use reductions on this scale uh, for heating and transportation. Most communities are trying to get to 100% renewable electricity, which we've, we're in the fortunate position of already building off of. So I think it's exciting from a, the standpoint of trying to reduce emissions and, and be a model uh, for work on climate change. It's exciting as well economically. Um, I didn't mention up front, but we've actually been able to hold rate steady since 2009. Uh, at BED, we're entering our 11th year uh, without a rate increase. Um, so we're delivering that value, but in this transition uh, that we're talking about, if we use more electricity, more renewable electricity, and get off of fossil fuels, uh, it actually has a significant local economic benefit. Um, if you spend a dollar at the gas station buying gas, about 80 cents of that dollar leaves the state of Vermont economy. We don't really benefit as much from that. Uh, if you spend a dollar at BED charging an electric vehicle, more than half of that dollar stays in Vermont, and more than three quarters of it stays in the regional economy. Uh, it's actually cheaper to drive electric uh, than to drive on gas. Um, I don't know if everybody has heard that, but uh, if you're driving on electric at one of our public stations around the community, uh, you'll see a sticker that says $1.46 a gallon equivalent, because that's the equivalent cost. Uh, if you're charging up at home, we have a special rate that can get you the equivalent of 60 cents a gallon if you're charging off peak during times when electricity is cheap. Uh, so there's a huge economic benefit as we transition away from fossil fuels, you use the local uh, electric company's uh, energy as opposed to the fossil fuel energy. Uh, the next two slides uh, are basically a list of different incentives. And I encourage everybody to visit BurlingtonElectric.com. Uh, you can read the entire roadmap report is on there. 
Um, but basically, we have incentives uh, for every type of electric transportation. Uh, we have e-bike incentives uh, for folks who want to ride an electric bike at all the different local bike shops, uh, $200 off. If you're looking to purchase a, or lease a plug-in vehicle or an electric vehicle, uh, we have a $1,200 rebate, and it's up to $1,800 for our low-moderate income customers. If you're getting a pre-owned uh, EV, uh, we have $800 off for that uh, as a rebate. Um, we also have home charging station incentives. We have electric bus incentives. We're expecting uh, two new electric buses to join the Green Mountain Transit fleet with incentives from BED uh, this month and uh, hopefully be in operation early next year. Uh, and then we also, as part of the uh, roadmap announcement, we've, we've moved into some new areas, uh, particularly cold climate heat pumps where uh, you can displace a portion of your fossil fuel heating uh, and have very efficient air conditioning and very efficient uh, heating. Uh, heat pump water heaters, uh, also a very efficient way to, to heat your hot water as opposed to using natural gas. And uh, I don't know if anybody's looking for an electric forklift, but we have a brand new incentive program uh, for that as well. Uh, $6,500 off for those electric forklifts. And, uh, and actually, we've had a real big success with our electric lawnmower program. Uh, we have seen, I think it was um, nearly 150 Burlington customers took advantage of that this past summer. Uh, we sold out all the Ace Hardware stores in the area of electric mowers. and. Hope to have another good run at that uh, this coming summer. And uh, when we talk about electric vehicles, charging always comes up. Uh, we have currently uh, 15 charging stations with 27 uh, charging ports, public stations in the community. We've got a, one here at uh, City Market that's a private station. Uh, we have some of those as well. We're going to uh, more than double the number of stations around the community over the course of the next year with a particular focus on getting charging stations at multifamily buildings so that if if somebody is a renter or living in a multifamily building, maybe doesn't have a place to charge, that they're going to have opportunities as well. We want to make this accessible to everybody. And uh, we also have a new charging station uh, right on uh, Main Street and St. Paul uh, with a car share uh, electric vehicle. So if you're a member of car share or you want to sign up, uh, they have a new Nissan Leaf called Sparky. I guess they name all the vehicles. And uh, you can check it out and, and drive electric and see, uh, see if you like it. So I think we'll go ahead and wrap there and see if if there are any questions for us that we can answer uh, now, or you can feel free to email us uh, as well. And thanks for your time. Yeah. Um, so district energy has been talked about for at least 30 years now. That's right. So we're not, however long uh, McNeil has been there. Um, why hasn't it happened, and what are the real prospects of it happening in the near future? It hasn't happened because of cost, I think, is probably the, the right answer. Um, getting the infrastructure in place uh, to get uh, either hot water or steam uh, from McNeil and pipe up the hill and get it to some of the larger customers who could use it, UVM Medical Center, UVM, uh, downtown buildings, uh, is not inexpensive. Um, the reason I have some optimism now uh, is we've been working intensively on this in a very serious way for the last several years uh, with uh, Vermont Gas at the table, with UVM Medical Center at the table, UVM, uh, and have had a concerted effort to do feasibility work around it. We think that there is a case uh, for uh, getting probably steam uh, more than hot water. We were looking at hot water, but probably steam uh, getting a connection to UVM Medical Center and then potentially UVM and eventually other buildings as well. Uh, it's very tough to compete with natural gas on a fuel cost basis right now. Natural gas is very, very cheap. Uh, so for customers who are looking at it, there's going to have to be a little bit of a longer view and a little bit of a view towards the carbon benefit, the carbon reduction benefit. Because what you're doing is taking essentially uh, lost energy in some cases that, that's you know, going up the stack at McNeil now uh, and some additional energy we can produce there and utilizing it. So it'll be a good thing uh, from an environmental standpoint, but uh, we have to get the economics right to get the customers on board. Just, just, yep. so um, is there, is there uh, a path forward for that? I believe there is. Uh, we, we're at the table with all those folks trying to work through that right now. Uh, if it's a pure economic scenario, what's the cheaper, uh, you know, BTU of fuel? Is it going to be from natural gas or district heat? It's going to be from natural gas. So we have to have the conversation in a kind of a bigger context than just uh, comparing the two fuel sources. UVM Medical Center has been very, very environmentally conscious. They're very committed to, to looking at this solution with us. Uh, we've had good conversations with them, with UVM. And uh, Vermont Gas actually had an announcement last month. I don't know if folks saw it. 
uh, where they committed to working to decarbonize their system through a variety of things, including district energy in Burlington. So we've got some commitments that are helpful. Uh, I have some optimism, but uh, it's an uphill it's an uphill battle uh, to make sure that the economics can be uh, at least comparable, uh, maybe not cheaper, but at least get them to be comparable where a uh, customer can say, yeah, I want to be an off-taker of that energy. That's what we're working on. Uh, we're also looking at securing some incentives from the state to help us make the project a little more uh, cost competitive as well. What about for a big steam project for the University of Madison? What about a carrot and a stick thing? In other words, they have to pay extra if they stick with natural gas in some way, but they get incentives from the state or whatever you can get. Right. I mean, that goes to a point that um, you know, the mayor has made and, and others, which is uh, we probably need to have a price on carbon pollution in Vermont. Um, mm -hmm. And we don't have that right now. So essentially, if you're using uh, fossil fuel, you're not really paying for the, the uh, cost of the pollution. Um, the city uh, is starting to use, the uh, mayor announced this in November, I believe, uh, is going to use the cost of carbon for evaluating our own fleet purchases in the city, our own heating system purchases in the city. Um, there was a resolution that Councilor Mason and others supported uh, that uh, basically set up a report back in January of all the things that the city is going to do uh, to help move towards this net zero energy goal. Um, but your point is, is, is well taken. If we were pricing carbon pollution accurately, this project would pencil much easier. Uh, it's, it's certainly correct and uh, we're supportive of the state moving in that direction. Yeah. yeah. Yes? I noticed that you had on there <clears throat> the electric water, hot water built on the heat pumps. Mm -hmm. You guys, and you all should know, I've got about a $4,500 bill, but because of what BED is doing and some other companies, I'm going to get almost $1,800 rebate yep. back on the $4,500 bill so uh -huh. that my major heat will be using electric and I've got solar and I've got extra solar coming through about $400 I think now so I'll be able to use that towards um, the price of running the heat pump mm -hmm. but um, that incentive just started a few months ago right that's right so please look into them for the heat pump for heat but I didn't know that you also had one for hot water I've got a wheel McLean that runs the heat plus the water mm -hmm. uh, yep. together. So I don't know whether in a tiny house and a tinier space for all this, but I don't know whether right you, we should have you look at that. They're coming on the 30th of December. Uh huh. For the heat pump. So maybe we do want to connect you with the uh, residential energy services team just to make sure it burns. Um, Chris is is, is in charge. Oh, Chris Burns. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, I didn't know you were doing um, the water, so I should talk with him. Yeah. Um, we can talk afterwards, Carolyn. It's helpful. Thanks yeah, for what you're guys. doing, though. Yeah, yes, thank you. those guys over in the co-op. I don't know if I would sure look at putting heat pumps in. Yeah, it's a problem. Each unit has its own uh, heating system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that may be easier. So each person puts their own thing in. Mm -hmm. But it's quite expensive uh, to do 24 of these. And, and we have some low-income people. We have people who are on support. You know, so you state. can't just do your own heat over there yourself? If you I could own. if I had the money. But I'm just saying their incentive is half the price. So to me, it makes sense. Well, so that was one of my questions, actually, is, is you know, you mentioned that the rebate goes up for mm -hmm. what's defined as low, moderate income threshold. What is, what is your threshold as to what is low, moderate income? So we use the uh, CEDO metric. CEDO has, uh, for the city, uh, metrics that are online um, that we go by, and it depends on how many folks are in the, the unit or in the household. Uh, but so we use the city metrics. But uh, to your point, with the heat pumps, uh, you know, they're, they're modular, so they can heat a space uh, and condition a space, you know, fairly efficiently. And uh, right now, with the incentives that we're offering uh, for a you know single unit heat pump, it can run you know thirty five hundred, four thousand dollars to install, uh, but we can get up to twenty two hundred uh, back from BED. Mm. And uh, there are a number of credit unions, particularly. Well, it's not specifically just you. You've got um, BEIC, I think, and then someone giving money for. Oh, we fund that too. Yeah. Okay. We, we do that part of it as well. That, oh, so okay. There's an upstream and a downstream, so the customer gets a rebate and then the installer gets a discount to offer to the customer, but it nets out to about, I think, $2,200 oh, uh, total. But then if you're, if you're looking at doing any of these types of things, 
Uh, you know, VSCCU is a partner of ours, as are a few other the credit unions, Green yeah. Mountain, uh, Vermont Federal. They all have really good energy loan programs. So if there's a gap between what our rebate covers and what the cost is, uh, you can finance it unsecured. You don't have to have collateral for that. And you can get a rate that's fairly reasonable, uh, much, much better than uh, what a regular personal loan would be. And uh, they're doing a great job getting access to these projects. So, you know, there's going to be a payback. Uh, with the energy savings on a lot of these projects so they can help make it so that your hopefully your monthly out of pocket is, is relatively uh, level. Question, most of our units are two story. Mm -hmm. Would you need one on each floor? Potentially, potentially. They have, yeah. they have a unit where you have one outdoor unit and it can connect to two indoor units. Huh. Uh, so I have heat pumps in my uh, upstairs uh, three bedrooms. We have one yeah. unit in each of the bedrooms and one outdoor unit that it connects to. Uh, so that'll cost a little bit more, uh, but we do have incentives that can cover yeah. some of that as well. Um, they're a real interesting technology. It's only you know five, six years ago that these yeah. really started uh, going in, and now there's a significant market for them in Vermont uh, for the cold climate. You know, these, the technology's been around forever, but it didn't used to work when it was okay. negative five, and now it does. Uh, so it's, it's impressive. Yeah, I run them every night uh, during the winter. It uh, doesn't matter what the temperature is outside, they work. Uh, that's, that's great. It's been, I've had them for about five, six years, yeah. But you have a second heat source, right? We do, so we have a zone heating system. So we have uh, like an Energy Star, like you were saying, a Will McLean uh, boiler, because uh, we have natural gas, And but basically what I can do is turn that zone off and use the heat pumps only for that zone. We figured out that the bedrooms were where we were using most of our heating energy, because uh, we have two kids, and so at night, you know, we. We'd be running heat up there from 8 at night when the kids go to bed till maybe 7 in the morning or 6.30 whenever everybody got up. So being able to turn that zone off has saved significantly on our, our fossil fuel use. And not to mention, like I mentioned earlier, uh, very efficient air conditioning. Yeah, the air conditioning already. Yeah, much better than a window unit, much cheaper than a window mm -hmm. unit. Yeah, yeah. Any other uh, questions we can answer now that anybody has? Well, I guess just if there's little things we can all do, like... Yeah. Planning more more garden and less mm -hmm. grass or something to let us know. Yeah. I Thank would, you. I wonder if others went to the climate summit that was at the ED. Did anybody else here go to that? It was on the third, I think. It was very good. Right. Yeah. Thank yeah. You for doing that. Yeah. That's yeah, uh, a group of state legislators who are working on uh, various bills. Yeah, there are um, about a hundred people from Burlington. Yeah. Over there. Yeah, that's our spark space, our community space, uh, kind of like this room, a little bit bigger, uh, down at Burlington Electric. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks for having us. We really appreciate it. And if uh, you check out the website, if you have any questions, let uh, me know, let Ted know. We're, we're glad to, to help answer them. Yeah. So we are um, in, in Ward 5 at the MTA. We're committed to doing some segment of our meeting on the climate related to the climate emergency every month. Mm -hmm. So we'll have you back. Great. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. We have an electric bike. There's so many things we can do. Yeah, and I have some electric cars for us to try. Yeah, we can I'll totally do that. Yeah. There was a thing recently that they really did that there was. Was to try yeah. electric yeah. cars. It was over at uh, the Wind and Waves parking lot. Uh, oh. We had three or four different, uh, we had uh, Tesla, Hyundai, uh, Audi, and uh, who was the fourth one? Was it the Nissan? The Nissan, yeah. 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 Maybe they'll, I mean, they've got that big building to fill. Maybe we can get them to We'll do another one of those. Mm -hmm. uh, some it was a fun event. A lot of people got to test an electric car. That's the thing. If you drive one, you're going to like it. Uh, and it's just important to get more people uh, to experience it because uh, people don't realize that the performance is incredible. Uh, it's not just more efficient. It's not just you know, zero fossil fuel. Uh, instant torque, lots of good uh, you know, power and performance in those vehicles, new technology. And uh, we're working very soon. I think in the new year we'll be able to announce um, that uh, we'll have a partnership with some area auto dealers who are committing to do more to uh, to move electric vehicles, and we'll be announcing that. And the state just announced a new incentive as well, uh, up to four thousand or five thousand off uh, for low moderate income Vermonters. So, uh, a lot of opportunities to drive electric. Oh, I thought there was a seven thousand off the test. There's a federal credit that's up oh, to seventy five hundred. So between the federal credit, our rebate, and the state rebate, it's possible to get thirteen thousand or so off of a Nissan Leaf or a Chevy Bolt or some of those different vehicles. So good opportunities to drive electric. We're enthusiasts, uh, but, but let us know. We're glad to set up a test drive for anybody anytime. Maybe that's a spring event on the parking lot, pre-meeting yeah. or something. Yeah. Get yeah. cars here. Yeah. It's a little dark right now. So. Yeah.
Yeah, yeah. Well, no, yeah. Yeah. We can do yeah. some dance. Yeah. Yeah. We can definitely do some dance. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for having us. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Right now. So, so, I don't know if you noticed in our agenda, Jen and Darren, that yeah. uh, Spencer yeah. has a proposal oh, about uh, electric vans. It might be yeah. interested in here. We would, you know, we would next time. Oh, oh, great. Well, we, we are um, talking to a company yeah. who's going to do a, a demo yeah. for um, the city and local businesses of van companies. So we're going to have a van here soon. Yeah. I do want to hear more about this. He's just suggesting you stay for 15 yeah. minutes. Green Mountain Transit wants to get these I, in Burlington. We will not set a program. I am Absolutely. already. Thank you for this. Yeah. Great. I wish I could. Thanks for having me. I'll grab a thing. Pleasure. All right. So, uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, our very own Spencer Smith reached out um, wanting to do a presentation on electric fans. And so, thanks for reaching out, Spencer. We're looking forward to what you have to say. Okay. The floor is yours. This uh, follows really well. On, uh, I just gave one of these uh, proposals to uh, Darren. And, uh, said, uh, he said, oh, we could, uh, we could do an incentive for, uh, for these electric passenger vans. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is uh, the idea of public transportation here being electric, but not big buses, passenger vans, which are much cheaper. And there's a, full, a program that Ford has with a, an organization called um, uh, uh, Lightning Systems. It's in Colorado. And uh, it creates a, a Ford body of a van holding like 12 to 15 people. And then uh, this lighting system is put in the puts in the electric drivetrain. And the price is quite different from an electric bus. So um, I, I think I introduced myself already. I'm from across the street here. And I live, I've lived in Burlington since 07, been in Vermont since 1990. Uh, and uh, I've really become quite concerned about the climate issue that we have, the change in climate. That, life is not going to be sustainable here on this planet for human beings and for many other species. So we can also we can feel guilty about that. Um, but we've all lived off the, off the fat of the land, so to speak. In other words, even those of us who don't have a lot of money have had a very good life here in the United States compared to so many regions, which are now suffering even more uh, than we will in the near future. And so we're, this is why we have this refugee problem of 65 or 70. Five, uh, 70 million people because a lot of it is climate change. So, so this got me really wanting to do something. And last spring, when you know the weather turned good and I wanted to be out walking all the time, <laughs> good weather. I was walking past a couple of times. I would walk past the city market parking lot up uh, that famous Briggs mud hole, <laughs> which <laughs> the city should feel the same shamed of that they haven't paved it in about 40 years. Um, regardless of whatever happens there in the future. And I saw parked, uh, not in the, city, in the city market lot, but behind it, there's, there's some land there that's just open. And uh, two to four passenger vans. I looked at them, I thought they were pretty good looking, and, and they looked, you know, they're fairly long, not like, a, not like private uh, SUVs or whatever. They can hold maybe nine or 10 people. Uh, and um, so I began thinking, you know, I'm. My background is the arts, actually. Uh, I've been a visual artist and a writer, and I write fiction and, and some poetry, and, and I've done journalistic kind of stuff, interviewing people. So I just started thinking in my mind, well, what if these could be electric? You know, I had no idea how it could be. So I, uh, I talked to, um, happened to meet here, at, maybe it was the June meeting, uh, Jeannie Lyons, who is one of our senators. And uh, we just happened to get to talking, and I thought, oh, I said, what do you think of the idea that what if we had electric passenger vans? And I told her I'd seen these vans that looked pretty good. And she was very interested. She said, well, look into it. So I go online and start searching for electric vans. Well, they're in China all over the place, of course, for public transportation. But uh, really not in Europe. Uh, and a lot of uh, these things are used not electric. But it's, it's many third world countries have these vans, or they're all over. 
And we don't have them so much here. Mostly you see them as like a hotel has a van that gets people from the airport and that kind of thing, but they're not electric. So uh, I started looking into it, and I'll pass these out in a minute. We can look through them. But uh, first of all, uh, the cost between a book. Well, okay. Pass them out. okay, great. We'll keep one of these. Yeah, you can do So one bus, as you'll see on this, one electric bus costs a million dollars. Now, two years, in 2017, uh, <coughs> Senator Leahy apparently told Green Mountain Transit they were giving, he was getting us two buses. And it was going to cost $500,000 for these two buses. And I wasn't sure, it wasn't clear to me whether he was getting the money for it or whatever. So um, they still haven't come, so far as I know, and it's been, but as we're going into 2020, so it's three years ago. So here, if you look at that on the first page, uh, point A is the advantages of electric passenger runs over electric buses. Number one, of course, is the cost. For a million dollars, you can have one bus. For about that money, you can have uh, 10 or 12 passenger vans. And they can be adapted to handicap. They can be, uh, they have special safety factors. Uh, we'll see as you read further. So we can have more buses, which is a big problem. There's been declining ridership. But why has it been declining? The price keeps going up. The schedules get worse. You know, they, they cut, like Pine Street used to run every 15 minutes at rush hour, and then I think every half hour in the middle of the day. Now it's only every half hour. So it's, well, you can walk over to Shelburne Road. I'm sorry, I'm 80 years old, in snow and ice, I am not going to walk to Shelburne Road. <laughs> you know, and it's, we should, we should have more of these. And this would, this would enable us to have much more coverage and have more frequent and go more places and so on. So uh, then the idea of having the bus, taking all that money into a big bus, you might be, well, we'll have it for, you know, 20 years. But technology is changing a lot. People are talking about hydrogen now that might replace the lithium batteries. We've already had hydrogen here. We have hydrogen buses. Cars? Buses. Oh, well, I haven't been aware of that. We have natural gas. Or natural, or natural gas. gas. I'm sorry. I was going to say hydrogen. hydrogen. I don't think so. I would have heard about it. <laughs> well, <laughs> anyway. Yes, I was like, well, I knew it wasn't normal. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's a fossil fuel. So, whatever. Yeah. So, um, so then if, you, if we had, uh, instead of like five buses, we had uh, five times 10, you know, 50, bu 50 of these vans. If you have, you could like do a changeover gradually if you don't have all your money sunk into one big thing and you, you can have it, you know, for the new technologies. Um, our streets are so narrow because so much of the city was laid out uh, before modern, uh, you know, probably lots of it was before cars. If you look at, go on Union Street or South Winooski, South Union, it's uh, a lot of um, big houses that were probably built uh, in the 19th, late 19th, early 20th century. Um, and the smaller vans could not only have more maneuverability on those narrow streets, but it would allow more space for bikes, lanes, and pedestrians. And, and that would be a big plus. So, as you see at the bottom of the page, electric passenger vans are widespread in China and being planned for urban use in Germany. I think UW is getting uh, one, but I don't even know if it's out yet. But so far, this Ford Lightning system uh, is the only passenger van here in the US. And I've talked to the people at, at Ford, Heritage Ford, uh, and that would be a great source of jobs, actually, if we had a bunch of these. They could inst install the electric systems, drive trains. Uh, they could, you know, could have somebody trained to do that, and then they could do any uh, repairs or servicing, which is a big cost savings. I, I talked to the um, uh, the guy who's the head of the uh, the union here, the union bus drivers, um, Rob Swinerland, I think is his name, and he, I said, well, one complaint I've heard is you have to hire more drivers if you have a lot more of these vehicles. He said, I think it would come out as a wash between not having the price of the diesel or the, the gas, and then uh, 
Maintenance is so much less in electric vehicles. So, and they spend a lot of money on maintenance because half of the fleet, apparently, according to my source at uh, Green Mountain Power, it shouldn't be on the road. You know? And it's a problem because the Green Mountain budget does not include new vehicles, I was told. Okay, in other words, they have to be gifted from the legislature to get a new, or Leahy or whoever to get a new vehicle. Um, so, uh, let's see, and all, people said, well, are they safe? You know, well, the Ford vans are the SSTA vans that take around older people and sick people. So, you know, uh, they're considered safe for them. And the longer passenger vans have these side airbags, which is an additional safety feature besides seat belts and, and the other issues. Then we have a problem with cars, um, which this could help with. How many people who drive a car downtown are trying to, you know, tearing their hair trying to find a parking place? Um, so, and then the, the roads are all parked up. You know, you go down Union Street or South Winooski, both sides of the street are parked up with cars. And I think they're starting to, the city's starting to take away some of that. Like I noticed they've just taken away a whole block of Flynn for parking, which is good because it's been a terrible blind spot for those of us who are in the, in the 24 units coming out of our driveway and we've had accidents because of that. Um, so also, uh, there are more and more cars, and I think part of it is, and I don't know what the thinking is of the car companies, but they're, they're producing uh, cheaper and cheaper uh, gasoline cars. <coughs> and so people, you know, I, if you look at the ads, you can see, you know, 159, uh, a month for a brand new gasoline car and more, and some of them are more. But it seems like because the economy has been good, there are a lot of big trucks that are being bought, uh, what I call the vanity truck, <laughs> and then there's uh, a lot of SUVs for people who live in Burlington who don't really need an SUV. Um, then some people can't afford cars. Some people out of principle uh, will not drive a car but other people just can't afford it, you know, and so they have to ride the public transportation where the, the cost is going up even for low-income people. So, on page three, the last page is how do we get people out of their cars and into electric public transportation? Uh, and this is, you can read through that. Um, partly is we, we could have longer service hours. You know, I can't go by bus downtown to, to a, a literary discussions with what I do every week. I have to drive down because the bus stops running at 6.30 and this goes till 8.30. And how many people want to go to movies or a concert or something? You know, you have to drive or, or whatever, or, or a bike. And some of us, I'm not able to bike physically uh, because I have joint replacements. But even if, you know, but this is a limited thing. So um, the other thing is, we could abolish fares, and that would increase ridership. Um, apparently, I've heard 7%, I've heard 10% that this, the portion of the budget that is income from fares is only 7 or 10% of it. So really, if you're not doing away with it. And we could cover that probably by a one cent a gallon of tax on gasoline. In other words, you take so it would incentivize more people to ride the bus if it were free, whether they could park their car at home and take the bus. And the, the idea, I don't know if I put this in here, the idea of having, um, yeah, it's a point eight here on the last page, having free parking lots or high rises. Exit 12 is soon going to have a park and ride lot. Well, we can have more of those. And so people could, who are driving in could park whether they were going to Williston or to Essex Junction or coming into Burlington, <coughs> there could be uh, passenger vans, the electric passenger vans could take them into town. Um, so, uh, so questions. Uh, and I just want to say if you're interested in more information or want to get involved in this project, I feel like I've been struggling with this in a way alone uh, because like I'm a Quaker and I'm involved in that group, but they most of them live outside the city. So they're not too worried about uh, you know transportation in town. Uh, so anyway, any questions, discussion? I mean, whatever. Yeah. Um, so you talked to the 
drivers in the Green Mountain trans Transit. Yeah. Um, have you talked to the management? Well, their management is sort of temporary. You know, the guy who was there for quite a while was fired or on leave or something, and, and I get the impression from people I talk to in the city and the legislature that, you know, he, and then also the drivers, that he's not doing a whole lot. And I, I, don't, I don't know him, you know, I've only spoken to him on the phone, but. but well, um, what about the board? What about the board? Well, I've got the name of somebody on the board that I have wanted to contact, and I can't remember his name, but I have written down at home. Um, yes, I know there's a, a commission or a board, right? So maybe we have the names of the board people. Jim Spencer. Yeah, I've talked to him personally a couple times. And he's interested. I've talked to Joan Shannon. She was interested. She raised the question about the cost of drivers, which apparently would even out uh, because of the other reduced costs. Um, who else did I talk to? Uh, well, both um, Lyons and, and Mary Sullivan, who's our rep from this war. Uh, and then there was the big meeting that was at BED, and I was really heartened to see that there were a lot of people. They're going to have a very strong committee in the legislature, a joint committee between the Senate and the House, dealing with uh, transportation. And what we heard tonight, this works with it. Yeah. Did you sort of just figure out how many buses that we have running in Burlington? And it seems like they're all big. And when I asked them why they run all big, and they said, well, there's rush hour. And I said, yeah, well, that's big in an hour, but you don't need to run. Then you yeah. run two buses, you yeah. know what I'm saying, instead of these big ones. That right, right. Um, did you, or were you able to get to a point where you would say, hey, Burlington could you, you know, would be best served by, say, 20 of these little vans? and get rid of all the big ones, or 10, well, or 50, I think, or any you know, idea of... probably we should phase out uh, and phase in. Uh, uh, true, but then maybe, but yeah. I don't even know how many buses we have. I don't either, but... That might but, be a good way to start. Yeah, but I think we should probably retire some of the ones that are in I'm sure. shape. I'm sure. Yeah. And but we say if we yeah. have 20, then we know our good. goal is, and yeah. um, one big bus is yeah, uh, yeah. Of three bands replaced one big bus. You know, sort of, has that been sorted out? I don't know how many people ride in a big bus. Well, they can hold 30, I think, or something. 30. Like so that. then we'd say 10 of, if three of these for a big bus. Okay, I mean, we just sort if of, you we know, start getting if anybody figures. wants to work on this, you know, yeah, like, so do, some, do so research, it would be great. Yeah, I just want to, so I yeah. see you have the list there. If people yeah. give you their name and, and the email, what's your thinking? Is, is your thinking that well, you're going to yeah. try to get a meeting together? Yeah, get or, a meeting. yeah okay. thank you. Yeah, I'd like to get a meeting together of people who are interested in working on this. Because I've been one person doing all this research, and I have another life, you know, a writer, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so on. Um, but yeah, I'll pass this around to anybody who wants to uh, sure. put your email address on there and your names. And then, uh, I sure would talk with BED. Those people who just yeah, there. well, I just, on the way out, I gave uh, Darren. That sounds like the right the And right he said, well, we could figure out a way to get incentives for this. So well, that would be great. Yeah. Well, they want to reduce the transportation, so it seems like a logical bit. Yeah, well, it would cut pollution and it would be better transportation coverage. I don't know, should, you should probably see the home. You've got a lot more information than well, the rest of you're right. I mean, trying to tie it to the net zero and the production of vehicles. It would work towards that, yeah. 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 But through the ED or just? Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah, I would take a proposal right to them and have them because they've got figures the people. Yeah, which is good. Well, also the legislature is just. The Maybe money is on the legislature, up. mostly. So, you know, yeah. if there's incentives, it comes from Montpelier or probably the Fed, some of it. You're good at it. Yeah, I'm just saying is I think they have the right people in place. Yeah, which is great. That's why I was really glad to do the presentation. And I knew they were really supportive because when I went to that big climate summit uh, on December 3rd, it was, it was very good. Yeah. Well, Spencer, I really, okay. appreciate, I really appreciate your work on this and also appreciate your using us as to talk about it. Awesome. Yeah, well, I'd like to go to all the boards. It would be great to go to all the boards. Because we really need to know. We really need a swell of, of the people behind this, I think. You know, so we get the legislature saying, well, these people really want this, they're working for it.
Well, well, there's a new tool. I think you used it to sign up with us, but there's a new tool where you can sign up relatively easily now to get on the agenda for the other NPAs. So, oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So talk to one of us, and I yeah, we, can, that we can point you in the right yeah. direction. Yeah. Super. Yep. Okay. Do we get yeah. to hear from Chip? Nope. He's just here for Chip's not. Mike and Jeff. Chip wants to be a participant. Nope. No. City Hall feedback? I don't think we have time. Well, we didn't. We, I mean, in, in Chip's defense, we didn't invite Chip to be on the agenda. <laughs> 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 well, anything you want to talk uh, about, you know. <laughs> but what I will say is that, um, you know, as Chip mentioned, uh, the Democratic caucus is, is coming up. and. Whoever the Democratic nominee is, we have a progressive nominee as well for city council. And I know that our NPA is, is going to be planning here at some point uh, in February, I believe, a, a candidate forum that we'll be inviting folks to. And uh, there will be a school board race as well. Uh, so perhaps uh, uh, Mike, Mike's seat is up. And so I, well, maybe you'll tell us, but <laughs> as to whether or not you're running again. I am running again. OK, well, there you go. Uh, so if that turns out to be a contested race, we'll invite Mike and whoever else is running for school board to a forum as well. Um, I hope you invite him even if he's not. Yeah, even if he's not. Well, he will give you. We'll give you the floor. Me, myself. Um, <laughs> but we did, we did invite uh, our school board representatives to be here, uh, Jeff and Mike, so if you wanted to come up and... Thanks. If sure. we have a few minutes, maybe we'll turn it over to Chip at the end. So. <laughs> we'll be quick. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for making time for us. Um, we wanted to come and give an update on uh, the school board's budget process up to this point. So um, we have to finalize our budget by the end of January, I think it's the 27th, something like that. There's a bunch of stuff that has to happen before that. Uh, and so we just wanted to share with you where we are and the discussions that we've had. Um, you yeah, haven't really rehearsed or anything. So, you want to explain where we are, or you want me to? Oh, absolutely, sure. I mean, just briefly, we, we as a board meet quite a few times um, between October and, and January, inclusive. And um, we've had several intensive meetings. And uh, thanks to our superintendent and uh, finance director and others, they, they've been doing some planning as to what, what the needs are, what the adjustments should be. So we've received a, a rather lengthy list of potential additions. We've asked for some uh, potential cuts, and we haven't made any decisions yet. But there are clearly more potential additions um, than we can, we can fiscally accept. And I will say that if you generally speaking look at the the additions list that came from the principals and that sort of thing. A lot of them have to do with uh, problematic behaviors, um, supporting behaviors, um, social services, if you will, in the school district. And that has been a trend. If you look at, you, you all know this, you come into MPAs, you probably right up to speed on this, but the schools have become a place to provide not only an education but social services and we're seeing that a lot more. So there's there's a, a real need for more social workers, uh, behavioral support to make sure that the teachers are able to teach and not just uh, you know not not get too disrupted. And, and the kids are able to learn, right? So the goal of the district is to um, educate the, the kids academically, socially as global citizens. But if they're not ready to learn, if they, right, then they can't learn. And so it's very hard to focus on that. Academics, um, if you're, you're, you're dealing with trauma, or you don't have a healthy home life, or you haven't been socialized to collaborate with your team, with your colleagues, your, your classmates. Um, and so I agree with Jeff that the burden has been on, on the school district because those social services have not been provided outside of the schools. Um, the other thing that we are dealing with is the environment for funding. Um, there is a lot, it's very complicated how the schools get funded. If you have eight hours, I could potentially explain half of them to you. Uh, 
But one of the big things is that there's all these other factors that impact what <coughs> the budget means to your pocketbook. So as we're discussing it, we're learning bits and pieces. There's things, the common level of appraisal or CLA. There's the, the yield. Uh, uh, there's all these different things that have to be figured out. And when we put the budget forward, we can't even tell you definitively how much it's going to cost each taxpayer. So we can do an estimate. So we are working with our finance director to try and gather as much information so that we know <coughs> what the environment is that we're trying to plan around. Um, and that includes a recent decision around a statewide teacher health care agreement. So the legislature uh, put a law for I forget which law and act it was. There's a big negotiation between the Vermont uh, Teachers Union and the school boards. Um, and the uh, decision was just made to arbitrate, much arbitration made side in favor of the uh, Vermont NEA's last best offer. So there will be an impact to the amount that we have to pay into health care. We don't know what that impact will be yet. You know, the, the agreement was just made ooh, a week ago, a week and a half ago. And our analysis, analysis is not done on the impact. So um, just to clarify one point you made, we do know, you know, in dollar terms how much our school budget is and how much we are gonna choose to add to it. But the weird part that you're suggesting is you know, if we increase our our budget by four percent in dollar terms, uh, there's no direct correlation between how much our tax bills may go up or down. That they usually go up, of course, but um, and we don't know that until uh, these other metrics come in. Some of them come in not until after we we've, we've actually uh, voted on our budget as a school board. So it's really unsettling. So we're going to be as prudent as possible, consistent with the right thing for kids. How much could we have? Five minutes? We have questions. questions? Yeah. Carolyn? Last year we were voting on some new building down here. Are they still doing that or what's happened with that? So last year uh, there was a vote for the bond to renovate the high school that was passed. Yes, I know that. There one. was prior to that there was a bond <coughs> for maintenance maintenance across all the district's other properties that was supported. There was no vote specifically on any school or building at the Champlain property. What the board was considering was using that maintenance bond um, that financially it made more sense, that was the proposal put for, for forward, to build an addition to C.P. Smith and a, a separate building um, in the behind Champlain uh, the C.P. Smith building was going to be for early education, and the uh, Champlain building was going to be for early education and Burlington um, administrative offices. The, the board that got voted in two years ago put a halt on that. We've done a lot of community engagement. There was a task force that looked at this, the, the question of what's going to happen with early ed. What's the best solution? Should it be in every school? Should it be consolidated? So they've made recommendations to the uh, Finance and Facilities Committee, who has not put forward a proposal to the full board. So the quick answer to your question is nothing, is nothing was voted on, nothing was brought to the voters specifically about that building, and nothing has been decided from the board's perspective about what's going to happen to that property. Did I, did I read my memory? I don't know the state has already put forth the assessment of this, their increase, but did I, do I remember 4 or 6%? 6 percent of their <coughs> overall <coughs> estimate was based on what they know at that time. There would be a 6%, if all the services were the same, 6% increase on average uh, for the cost of, of providing those services. And is it as easy to translate as saying the average growing the taxpayers? But before even looking at your budget, we're looking at a 6% on the school based portion of our property. I don't think it's, it, no. It's not no, translatable. No, in fact, the, the, I'd have to double check as to what that 6% meant, but I don't think it directly yet meant yeah. our taxes are going up 6% if we do nothing. Okay. There are some pieces that are not in place yet to be able to 
determine that. My next one is not a straight budget question, but it was yeah. the register tweeted out, you know, the sort of update on the school, the, or the high school project. I mean, are you in discussion now about potentially delaying? And where, where does that stand? So what happened was we did, there's, there is questions about how we're moving forward. Right. So when you, and I'm not a construction guy, but what we've been taught is that as you move forward with the project, you have conceptual plans and they get more and more specific as you go. And so we did a number of plans up to the point where we said, we think we need this much money. And that's when we brought it to the voters. After that was generously approved, then we did more work and we did more testing. So one of the things they did is started to test the site and they found that we have some issues in the, in the soil. That the bedrock on which the buildings are built, which is nice and stable and you can drill in, and ends at the bottom of where the uh, gym is and there's sandy soil underneath. Mm -hmm. So our plan was to wrap around that part. You can't do that. It's going to be prohibitively expensive. So there was a uh, a lot of work that's been done to redesign how we're going to do it. Um, uh, in addition, as we vetted the plans with staff and students, they had all these great ideas. But of course, all those ideas cost money. So the estimate came in from the construction companies way higher. How much was it? Twenty percent? Well, it was it was something like, and then these were just preliminary numbers. Sure. This is just iterative stuff, yeah. but. You know, like 90 million, but clearly they've been working on yeah. honing that down and they're narrowing it down, we believe, and we're looking forward to an update from the Construction Oversight Committee to something much closer to the 70 that we've approved. And I guess when I, when, I, when I was, I don't remember the specific sequencing or timing, but are you, you're right, are you getting close to pushing that? I mean, yeah, I think you were already supposed to be construction have to the draw in the next about year. one year. Okay, so that's that has, has, I don't know whether that's a hard <coughs> firm. Nobody said it's definite, but I think that's where the tea the, leaves are yeah. that we are not going to start construction in the summer. Well, because of the challenges of the re redesign, yeah, no, apparently you have to put poles in so deep to get to the bedrock that it just, that would be, we'd be sinking too much of our money there. And I know that people want the new, you know, like my kids are going to go through school and, you know, and so there's concern about timing, but, you know, we want to be, and the other factor about slowing down is, the longer we wait, the more expensive it gets. That's just how construction is. Um, so we we're, we're trying to originally we're trying to see could we start construction in the summer, but we don't want to start it if we're not. Ready. I think we'll get an update in January from the professionals who are working on it. So we have completely new design now for high school. No, it's not completely new. It's it's adjustments, and I haven't even seen them. Why did someone put a stick down and see whether there was sand there? That's or not? a very good question. <laughs> and that very seems question. very simple to have done <laughs> before you go and design a building, presuming there's bedrock. You know what? Some of the other cost overruns that first appeared were apparently uh, PCBs. I don't know if you've all read about PCBs. And they're everywhere. Yeah. They're everywhere in the yeah. city. Yeah. So we can yeah. thank some yeah. Yeah. It Turns out to be a little more expensive than had been understood. Can you just briefly let us know what, from your all's perspective, the next few months will look like for you in gearing up for a search for a new superintendent? Yeah. Thank you for asking. Um, so we have uh, two committee chairs who are now working. Uh, first step is to, uh, we're going to get some professionals to help us uh, because most of us have not been through the selection of a superintendent. Right? We are volunteers, so hiring a professional search uh, consultant to help us. Um, uh, the, then the next step is to post an updated job description um, and start recruiting. And that, that to us is one of the most important things. It's not just put a post like on Indeed or something and, and wait for somebody. But we really want to get the word out and we want to find a candidate who fits as many of the criteria as we're going to put forward. Right? People have an idea of what the right person is for this job. It's a long list. We all have our thoughts. Um, and so we're trying to get as many candidates who can fit the majority of that criteria. But it's still in the early stages in that I don't think we've actually engaged. We've, we've we put out something equivalent to an RFP request for proposal from the, there's a maybe half dozen to a dozen firms nationally who handle this, probably closer to a half dozen. 
And so we've pretty much been able to narrow it uh, to maybe a couple right now. I don't think we've, we've have not signed on with any of them yet, but we anticipate doing that. And then they have a pretty uh, well-defined process, which is supposed to be best practice nationwide for, for, hiring a super, for finding and hiring the right superintendent. So I think that does, I know that does, because we just read the memo from our co-chairs who are Martine Gulick and Kendra Sowers are our two commissioners who are the co-chairs of the uh, superintendent search committee. There's going to be some stakeholder community meetings about what are you all looking for in a superintendent, what are the qualities that they'll run it in, a, I hope, a very good process and advertise it so that people will come and be able to provide some input on what are we looking for. And, and uh, yeah, and then they do whatever they do. To <coughs> it, is your target hire date overlap? You know, starting next fall, but overlap with the current superintendent. The what? contract we're we're hoping starts July first. Okay. Uh, and um, <coughs> yeah, I was, Superintendent Obang's uh, contract ends June thirtieth. So there will not be overlap. I we haven't gotten to that level of detail. There should be a handoff. I mean, that's just for right. me how executives should hand off to each other. I just don't know contractually how right. that. When, when you say overlap, do you mean would we hire even before Yao's term is up, or? No, I'm just trying, I mean, uh, yeah. But the idea is, is, there's some point in time where they transition. These and are the, the issues, fiscal year these are the people. Started right. up, but. But you're looking for next fall, is what we, I was No, we're looking for July 1. Or, yeah, yes. true, it's summertime, so. Right. But yeah, for next school year. Okay. Yeah, but it, tur it turns out, interestingly enough, we're. Ahead? No. no. I wouldn't yeah. think so. That's why I was like, wow. Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of, I mean, you were talking about public engagement process, engaging a search firm and hiring in a relatively six month period. That's aggressive. Yeah. What was it? It's aggressive times schedule. Well, yeah, we. It's an aggressive it, schedule. Oh, so it would be nice to have had the luxury of more time because I guess there is a seasonality to this. <laughs> I see. And we're a little bit behind that timing. So there's a pool that you may not. Yeah, when, that was, when was that? November, I think? Right. And so we obviously weren't looking right. for anybody until right. they announced, but as soon as he announced, we had we were forced to get right on it. Is there a reason he resigned? I, I, I think he's uh, he stated that pretty clearly in some publications. Uh, you know, he published in the community, and I couldn't recite it right here. I apologize, but I think he's ready for some new challenges and that sort of thing. We didn't do anything to make him leave. Did we do anything to make him leave? No. I mean, we just had the whole police chief mess. So. Yeah, we're having some problems here. But I don't think there were any fake Twitter accounts. <laughs> that we know of. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, I appreciate your all's work. Yeah. Yeah, but, uh, it's a yeah. lot of hours. And I also appreciate your reaching out to us to get on the agenda and continue mm -hmm. to engage in the community. And if you want to use us in any capacity in your superintendent search, I mean, I'm sure that We'd be happy to have you back to solicit feedback from the MPA as well. Okay, great. Thank so, you so yeah. much for having us. We yeah, really appreciate thank you for the questions. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Did we leave any time for chat? Nope. No. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't want to talk. <laughs> no, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. We'll have our meeting again in January. As I mentioned before, we're going to be over at uh, the, the space next to Pizza 44 at Queen City Brewery, and in February we'll have our Connecticut forum. So thanks everyone for coming. Thank you.